Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Peter Frank and I'll be leading this session today. We are going to be looking at getting started with cash basis accounting in Church 360 Ledger. A little bit about myself before I get too far into the presentation. I am the Senior Manager of Marketing Technology at Concordia Technology Solutions. I've been with our team here for about eight years now. I've been with our organization for going on 13. It's been great to be involved with Church 360 Ledger the whole way through. I remember on my first day with CTS, I went down and, and spoke with the developers and talked about what they were working on. And one of our developers was working on the very basis of Church 360 Ledger. He was going through the process of ensuring that credits and debits were always matched. And he had this automated process that ran. It was pretty cool to see. So this has been part of my life for a number of years now. I wouldn't say that I'm an expert at finances, but I have a pretty good idea of how Church 360 Ledger works and applies with those finances. You can reach out to me at peter.frank at cph.org or my email or my phone number. Uh, I'll caution you, my phone number will direct you to my email right now because even though I'm in the office presently, I've been working from home quite a bit too. So um, everybody in our building is pretty much gone. I come here for the webinars because it's easier to present in the peace and quiet of an empty five-story building. So feel free to reach out to me at my email address. That's probably the best way to reach me. A few housekeeping items before we begin. I've planned about 50 minutes for presentation, which leaves 10 minutes for question and answers at the end. I typically go over the presentation amount, but I do like to have that question and answer time. So feel free to ask questions throughout. You can put them in the chat. I'll follow up with them um, at the very end. If I happen to catch some of them during the presentation, great. But otherwise, I'll make sure I answer all of them before we leave. And then finally, we are recording this webinar. We'll be sharing this on the Resource Center of CTS probably tomorrow morning based on what hour in the day it is. So take a look or, or look there or look for an email from me in the morning. That's when you'll be getting this. If you don't know about CTS, we are the Church Administration Division of Concordia Publishing House, and we've been developing software for churches since 1984, longer than I've been alive. Not much longer, but just a little bit longer than I've been alive. And today we are talking about one of those, which is Church 360 Ledger. Now, to put it in context, Church 360 Ledger is part of a larger suite of products called Church 360. This is complete church management, and it involves Church 360 members, which is about managing members, your attendance information, your offering information, and also Church 360 Unite, which is our church website builder. So those three together combine to be Church 360, and we're always looking for opportunities to expand that. Now, Today's focus is only on Church 360 Ledger. We'll talk a little bit about offerings, but not in the context of assigning them to people. It's all about the numbers today, all about accounts and transactions and reports. Now, we've developed Church, pardon me, Church 360 Ledger to be intuitive, secure, and focused on the church. And you'll see those things kind of come up. I'm going to give a brief overview of our thoughts behind Ledger right before we get into the software. I'm making a few assumptions about you before we begin, just so that you know what I base my presentation off. I'm assuming you are not an accountant. Now, if you are an accountant, great. I appreciate you being here. But I'm assuming you're not, and that's the level that I'm presenting at, because so many churches have volunteer treasurers who are not accountants. I'm also assuming you're new to Church 360 Ledger. Now, we often have people who are using the software for a while coming into these training webinars just to get a better understanding. But I'm going to present it at a level where you are new to Church 360 level, Ledger. We're going to start at the ground level and work our way up. And I'm also assuming you're extremely busy. And so if you, as we're going through this, you have to step away to take a phone call or to text somebody. I know at this point in our history here in the United States, there's not a lot of people stopping by wherever you're at because everybody's sheltering in place. But I know there's plenty of things going on. So I completely understand that's why we record these videos and share them. So if you have to step away, that's no problem at all. The outline for today is that we're gonna look through the goals of Church 360 Ledger. We're gonna tour the software, really get into an overview of, of all the major aspects of Ledger. And then I'll take questions and answers at the end. But let's talk about the goals of Church 360 Ledger first. Well, we know that church finances are often managed by volunteers. I just mentioned a, a moment ago that I'm assuming that you are not an accountant. That would mean that you're a volunteer. Now, we do have some 
paid full-time staff who are not an accountants, but that's kind of a minority. Now, most volunteers are not accountants. Many of them are, but that means that because they're not accountants, because they don't always know what's going on, they don't have that histor history or that background, that training, accountability is even more important in the church than it would be elsewhere. Now, anytime you're dealing with finances, accountability is, is critical. But especially when you're dealing with people who may not understand finances as well as they would like, accountability is even more important. So we go about it by preventing the ill intention from doing wrong, and I'll show you a few key things with that. But we also prevent the well intention from making mistakes, and this is far more common in the church. Certainly you have a few bad eggs every now and then who are intentionally doing wrong things with church finances but those are few and far between. We still work to protect from those, but this one has been our focus, really helping those people who don't understand all of the credits and debits, how to manage their finances and, and get it in a, a good state at your church. So we designed Church 360 Ledger to increase accountability and prevent those mistakes. So the outline of our software presentation today is we're gonna go through chart of accounts. We're gonna use the example of Vacation Bible School because I like that example, it's timely, even though a lot of churches are not doing VBS right now, they are doing online VBS or at least thinking about it. And that is a really good example of a kind of a ministry in and of itself that is a microcosm of the church as a whole. And so we can use that for a number of different examples. And so one of the first things we're gonna be doing is setting up those appropriate accounts for Vacation Bible School. Then we're gonna talk about budgeting and the different tools that are available within Ledger for budgeting. We'll do a number of different transactions just to show you the flexibility of the software and some of those rules that we put in place to prevent mistakes from happening. We'll look at reconciliation. That's a key part of accountability, making sure that your bank statements match what's in your software. And finally, we'll look at reports. You know, that last step of accountability where you are showing the current financial state of your congregation to those stakeholders, to the church council, or to the members at large. So let's talk about cash basis accounting for a quick second. You're gonna see this implemented throughout, but I wanted to ex explain how this is distinguished from other types of accounting, such as accrual. In cash basis, you recognize income when it is received. So as soon as you receive those offerings or those non-charitable gifts um, or charitable deposits, however you want to phrase that, that's when you recognize it. And, and almost more importantly is that you recognize those expenses when they occur. I know that with accrual basis, it's all about when the value is utilized. So when the value of the income comes in or um, more often the value of the expense. Um, I know like, for example, in schools where you might have a 10 month year, you know, many churches have Lutheran schools, the teachers work 10 months out of the year, but the, the church and school pay them over the course of 12 months. And so it's, it's kind of held on. In this way, you would, track those expenses as soon as they occur. Every payroll, you wouldn't hold on to anything to, you know, just when the value is being gained. So I'm not gonna get into this too much, but cash basis is what Church 360 Ledger was designed for. And so that's what you're gonna see throughout of all of this. You know, as we look at restricted funds, it's built on cash basis accounting. So let's go ahead and log into the software. I'm gonna switch my screen over to Church 360 Ledger. If you are interested, you can start a free trial at 360ledger.com. I'm guessing that you've probably already started that, but if you wanna just sit back and watch, go for it. This is the main interface. As soon as you log into the software, this is what you get. And it's really a blank slate right now. You'll notice that we have uh, the logo up at the top, then church, I'll talk about what that means. On the far right on the top row, you have a printer icon, that's your print queue. You've got your reports as the next icon, kind of a notebook shaped icon. The settings cog has a number of different things. We'll be spending quite a bit of time in there. And then you've got your user settings, so you can go and change your password. That second row is what we call the Omnibar. This allows you to quickly get access to all of your different accounts. And honestly, there's nothing there right now, so you can't really see much, but we're gonna fill that up. Next, we have our transaction button, and there's a number of different transaction paths. We'll talk about the different types, but 
in a quick summary of that, they're all journal entries. That's all they are. But we create different paths to make it easier to enter these transactions based on the type. So we'll talk about transfers and deposits, payments, checks, journal entries, all of that stuff. And then this is the account view, which right now is empty. And so I'm not going to get into it too much until you can actually see something. Now, if you want to see it better, like on this screen, I zoomed in. You can use the little keyboard shortcut of control and the plus button and zoom things in a little bit more. So I'm going to go with this level for right now. Um, it might become a bit too zoomed in for me because I've got a pretty big monitor and this is filling it. But we'll see. I know it's going to be better for you if you can see the whole screen. One other thing to highlight right at the beginning, down in this lower right-hand corner, there's a, an I in a circle. This is our information center. This is where you can go to get helpful articles about Church 360 Ledger. You can also send a message to our support team and get the help you need. And then our phone number for support is listed there too, so you can give them a call. We want to make sure that you get all the help you need, whether it is a real support issue, you found an error or something, or you just need some training. That's what that's there for, and we are here happy to help. Well, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to highlight under settings is books. So books is essentially the collection of your chart of accounts and your transactions. It is truly the entirety of your ledger, if you will. Um, but we know that many churches have different um, sub-organizations or maybe equal organizations that are under one umbrella. So for example, if you are a church with a school, you might have one set of books for both church and school, or you might separate it and church is one and school is one. Or many churches have organizations within it, whether it's a men's club or an altar guild, who have their own set of books, and they manage that kind of independently of the church's finances. Well, you can use Church 360 for a ledger for all of those under one account. And so if you wanted to add a new one, you just go in here and type in school and say what the starting month is. It can be a different fiscal year than the rest of the books. And you can say what the starting date is. And so we would just say July 1st. And then you submit that. And now you've got another book. And up here on the top left where it says church before, you can toggle between church and school. So that's what books are. And that's why you have that kind of, you know, orphaned church name up at the top. It's just about what book we're in. Well, I'm not going to dig into that too much more. We, we don't even have one book set up. We're not going to dig into setting up two. But the next thing I want to show you is on the settings, you'll notice that there's a line in the center. The things at the top above the line refer to being unique to this book, whereas the things below the line refer to the account, meaning that anything that you set up, like in general settings, this applies to your entire account. So users and roles, payees, those are all shared by the different books. Now with users and roles, we'll look at that briefly at the end. With those, you can assign different books to them or different accounts within the books, but it's still all the same account. Whereas everything above the line is just for this book, such as chart of accounts. And that's what we're gonna get into next. I'm gonna jump back into my PowerPoint for a second and talk about the different types of accounts because it's easy to get these confused, if, especially if you're not used to finances. So the first one is your assets. Assets are the accounts that contain real cash. So when you think about that at a church level, you're looking at your bank accounts, essentially, almost exclusively your bank accounts. So your checking and your savings. These are real life money. These should be balanced with statements. Now, you might not have it in what's called a bank account. It might be some form of endowment or investment, but there's real cash value there. That's what assets are. Liabilities are a little bit different. Liabilities relate to real cash, but it's cash that you owe. So you might think of like a, a credit card, a church credit card. Hopefully most churches don't have credit cards with that's racking up debt and paying for that interest, but it's a great way to purchase things securely. And so they will, many churches will have a church credit card. Or if you purchase through an organization like Concordia Publishing House, you might have a house account. We allow that kind of credit for our customers. Well, that might be a liability where you place the transaction 
but you're not paying for it immediately. You're getting a, an invoice, and maybe you pay for multiple invoices at the same time. The transaction and the payment happen at two different times, and so in that in-between time, you need those dollars tied to a liability. We'll look at an example of that in a little while. Now, there's income accounts, which is also dealing with real cash, but it's real cash within a set time frame. So every year, you will be tracking your income to see what's coming into the church, and in a similar way, you'll be tracking your expenses, the money going out of the church. But these don't continue on forever. That's where your fiscal year comes into play. So during a fiscal year, you have set income and set expense. You budget for those, you incur the actual income and expense, and then at the beginning of the fiscal year, you start from scratch. Your assets and the liabilities never start from scratch, uh, other than the very first time. So that's really that difference. And so if you're new to accounting, if you're new to being a treasurer, Hopefully that helps you, and it's definitely gonna put the context on where we go next. So as we look at our chart of accounts, we're gonna set up different accounts for all four of these types. We're gonna start with assets. Now you've got two ways of adding to your chart of accounts. You've got regular accounts. So if I click new account, I'll say this is my checking account. Now I can enter an account number, but I don't have to. If you have an account numbering system, go ahead and use it. If you've already got a chart of accounts set up, great. But if you're starting this from scratch, just know you don't have to enter an account number. So I'm not going to. Next, I can say I can write checks from this account. And I need to put in an initial balance. Well, let's say I checked out my saving or my checking account online and I see that I have $25,645. There, so I'll type that in and hit submit, and that account's been created. Let's add another account. Let's call this our savings account. And in this one, I have $75,412. Now, we don't typically write checks out of this account. It's a savings account. It's meant there to be saved until we need to transfer money out. All right, well, I'll put that in there. Now, the next thing I, I'm gonna show you is what's called categories. Categories look like accounts, but they're not accounts. They're essentially roll-ups. So in this case, I'll create a category and I will call this American Bank. Nice generic name. Well, that's the bank where I have both my checking and my savings account. So I'm gonna roll these up under by dragging and dropping and moving to the right. And as I do that, you'll notice that this American Bank has a summary there. That has a hundred and one thousand dollars and fifty seven a hundred and one and fifty hundred one thousand and fifty seven dollars. Sorry, it's a little bit late in the afternoon, and my uh, my words aren't coming as freely as I'd like. So that's how you use categories. And now that they're kind of stacked underneath, I can drag and drop them together if I wanted to rearrange things. Now I can't move an asset account to a liability, but within that type of account, I could move things around. The next thing, you'll notice that as I create accounts, I now have more buttons that say new restricted. And this is where it comes into dealing with finances at a church, being a little bit different than dealing with finances for a business, but it's important for that accountability. You see in a church, you will receive donations for very specific purposes, and you are bound to provide um, the value for those purposes. Use those dollars for those specific purposes. So let's say that one of those is Vacation Bible School. Well, I'm going to create a new restricted fund, and I'm going to call that Vacation Bible School Cash. That's the cash that has been given to Vacation Bible School. I'm going to submit that. Well, as soon as I do that, I not only get that account, but I get a new unrestricted checking account. This unrestricted checking account is everything that is not set aside for a specific purpose. Now, if I go add another restricted fund, let's say mission fund, well, I don't get a second unrestricted, but it's that first restricted fund that then gives me an unrestricted amount. And that's where the balance of that account starts. All right, next we're gonna go into new restricted fund for savings. Well, I'm gonna add another one, and I'm gonna call this Vacation Bible School um, savings. Let's just say this is what's left over year after year. 
the let's say this cash is for um, this year's cash. We'll just go with those names. It's very clear what the purpose is. Well, just like with the checking account, I get an unrestricted for my savings. Everything stays in there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and save this now because we're going to move on to a different type of account. We'll confirm that. Let's move on to liabilities and create a new liability account. You'll notice it's the same kind of thing where you have a new account, new category. Well, I'm going to create a new one that says credit card and zero initial balance. And then I'm going to create another one that says CPH house account. And we'll also do a zero balance. So I don't have to put categories in. In this case, I don't really have that many liabilities, not enough to deserve categories. So I don't have to. I'm just going to hit save. Let's look at income next. Now, in income, there are a number of different things that you might want to track. It's all about money that's coming into the church. Well, there's two real big categories. There is the offerings, and then there is the, let's, what's the right word for it? Let's call it registration or fees. So in the realm of Vacation Bible School, you'll have people who donate specifically for Vacation Bible School, but it may not be enough to cover all the expenses. So you may charge $5 a kid. You may do that anyways, because it puts a little bit of a skin in the game, if you will, for the families that are signing up. They had to pay a fee. And so if they don't send their kids after signing up, they've kind of lost that. So let's go create another new account. And in this one, we're gonna call it General Offerings and a zero balance. And we're gonna add another one that's Vacation Bible School Offerings with a zero balance. Then I'm gonna create another one that is Vacation Bible School Registration Fees. Now I can create all these accounts and then I can drag and drop them. So offerings will go here, offerings will go under that, fees will go under fees. You have to drag it to the right to have it fall underneath it. But we've got a few places where we can receive income now. So I'm going to go ahead and save my changes. Finally, we'll get into expenses. Expenses is money going out. You can have as many categories as you need. So if I do vacation Bible school as a category, I could do an account for things like teaching materials. And then I could do another account for crafts and snacks. The reason you might do this is if you want to track your expenses by the type. It's all within Vacation Bible School, but you want to track how much you're spending on teaching versus crafts and snacks. Now, there's probably going to be a lot of different expense accounts at your church because you operate like a business. You have a building that you may be paying off still. You have electricity and gas, and then you have all of your activities that go on, like Vacation Bible School and Bible studies and you have your payroll for your personnel. So there's a lot of different types of expenses. We're not going to put those all in today. All right, I'll save my changes there. Let's now go back to the home page. Before, there wasn't much there. But now, as I go in here, you'll notice that I'm starting to get some numbers. The first thing is, is that I have a journal entry for my very initial balances. If I click on it, you'll see some details. There's equity and unrestricted um, checking account. That's where my initial balances come into play. If I click on assets, now I can drill down a little bit farther. It's a sub-level of assets as American Bank. And then I have my checking and savings account. And if I click on checking, now I get into unrestricted admission fund and vacation Bible school cash. You'll also notice that I have a reconcile button. You'll only see that on actual asset accounts, not on the sub accounts like the restricted funds, because that is something only you know about, not the bank. But the bank also knows about your checking account. And you'll notice that if you go over to American Bank and click savings account, you'll get the same kind of thing. Well, we have only start, set the initial balances. So let's go ahead and add some transactions to this and look at the different transaction types. So the first thing we want to do is we want to bring in some money. We want to deposit some offerings. 
So I can go to any screen or be on any screen and click this new transaction button. I don't have to be on the accounts I'm using. I'm gonna go up here and click deposit. This deposit will take me to a transaction screen that looks kind of like what you see in your checkbook. We wanted to make it familiar. Now, fewer and fewer people are using checkbooks, so it's probably looking less and less familiar as people aren't using that, but that's what it was designed to look like. Well, let's say we're taking offerings for the week. So we'll say weekly offerings, and let's say we put it in on Monday. You don't always have to go with today's date. There's no pay in this case. We're not paying money out. So the asset is the first thing we put in. Now, the deposit transaction path defaults to putting an asset in the left side and an income in the right side. You are putting money into your bank account and you are saying that it's coming in from different income accounts. So let's say we're putting it into our unrestricted checking account or into our checking account. We can put it into unrestricted or we could put it under vacation Bible school in that same account. Now these really should be the same account. If you are an accountant, you may say, well, I'm gonna do all these different ones at once. I'll deposit it separately, but it's gonna be on one transaction path. Some of this is going in savings, some of this is going in checking. You can do that. We don't stop you from doing it. But I think most of the time you're gonna want the same asset account. So the unrestricted and the restricted accounts underneath that. Well, now we're gonna put in the amounts. So let's say we got $2,500 for unrestricted and another $500 for vacation Bible school. So $3,000 overall. Well, we could put it all under general offerings, but we have this 500 here that was specifically given for VBS. So if I go here, you'll notice that there is VBS offerings. Well, that was for 500. Um, I need to balance this because I'm only putting in 3,000. I can't leave 3,000 there. I'll change that to 2,500. If you notice what I'm typing, it's trying to get these to balance. You see down below, what we have is called T-chart accounting, where you have your credits and your debits listed. Now, if you're not familiar with finances, that might be very confusing for you. Let me show you what it looks like on the back end of things. And again, for you accountants in the room, I apologize. I know you, you, know, you could describe this in your sleep. But for those of you who aren't accountants, I want to explain what's happening in the background so you know that what is going on in Church 360 Ledger is true financial software, you know, handling the credits and debits, even if you don't know that they're, what they're supposed to do. You need to have a balanced transaction between credits and debits for everything that you do. And in this case, a deposit, we're going to increase our assets. We're adding cash to our bank account, so that needs to be a debit. Well, that means the other side has to be an equal credit. Well, where's that coming in? Well, we are actually crediting our income. We're increasing our income to offset that increase in asset. You see, it aligns properly. If you did a decrease of a credit, you know, we'll look at that in transfers in a minute, it'll still align, but now you're decreasing that account. This will make more sense as we go. If you look here, our general offerings was an income account, and we credited that. Credited that. That's an increase. Our unrestricted and our VBS cash, those are assets accounts. By debiting them, we are increasing them. So it's still a balanced transaction, but the credits and debits did not have to be thought through. I described them to you. They're accurate, but you didn't have to think through it and figure out which was a credit, which was a debit. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Save my transaction, and it is now in place. Now, I'm under savings. I'm going to go back under American Bank and checking account. And now this year's VBS has some cash in it. Well, let's say that $1,000 of the unrestricted is actually meant to be under VBS. I can transfer that, and I go to new transaction, transfer. Well, this is initial balance of VBS cash. And I'm gonna do my income account as unrestricted checking, and I'm gonna put $1,000 there because this asset account is where it lands. So I'm gonna put it under Vacation Bible School cash. Well, that is debiting VBS cash and crediting unrestricted cash. Is that right? 
Well, we look at our chart. If we debit an asset, that means we increase it. Well, we're increasing the VBS cash account, so we want to debit it. And we're decreasing the cash under unrestricted, so we would want to credit that. Well, that's exactly what happens here. We credit the unrestricted, we debit the VBS, and now we have transferred money, taken it out of one account and putting it in another. There we go. All right, well, let's say next that we want to buy some VBS materials. If I go to transaction and go to, let's say, payment to start, let's say we go to the local bookstore. You can come here to Concordia Publishing House Bookstore. And you can say, I'm going to use my checking account and write a check for $175 to Vacation Bible School teaching materials because I am getting my starter kit. I think it's 175, it might be a little bit more. That's okay. I'm just gonna write a check for it right now, pay for it and be done. Well, you'll notice that the unrestricted is being credited. That makes sense, we're decreasing the amount and the teaching materials are being debited. Well, does that make sense? We're not returning things. Well, now, if you look here to increase an expense, you are debiting that account. That's what that's all about. So you're debiting your expense and you're crediting your asset. Let's go ahead and save that. Now you need to buy materials for VBS. Well, we're going to put that on our CPH house account. So I'm going to go to New Transaction Payment and say, well, this is Concordia Publishing House. Oops. I'll just leave it at that. And we are going to put this on our house account. That's what we're essentially paying for with it. And we're going to buy $200 worth of crafts. That's it, same kind of thing. Debits and credits are the same, they align. But now remember this time, the house account is a liability, not an asset. And it's still being credited, but it's because we're increasing the, or the liability. We're increasing how much we owe to CPH. So that's where the difference is. So we'll go ahead and save this. Whoops, oh, gotcha. The name was wrong because I kept trying to put in book. So I'll just save that. Now, payees is something I can show you real quickly. If you click on a payee, you're going to get to their history. But if you go to settings and payees, you can actually manage them. And so we're just going to call this Concordia Publishing House, just for simplicity's sake. Let's go back to unrestricted checking. And you can now see we've got a number of different transactions, but we don't have the crafts yet. The crafts were put on a house account. And so now what we have to do is pay off that house account. Well, if you go to new transaction and payment, let's do check actually. We're gonna mail CPH a check. Pardon me, so just a second. What we wanna do is pay off the amount that we owe them. Well, let's see what that is again. If we go to our liabilities, there's our CPH house account. We owe them $200. So let's go and do a payment or a check, pardon me, and say we're paying Concordia Publishing House, and we're paying, taking it out of the liability, $200, and that then is going out of, oops, I did that wrong. We're paying the, out of the unrestricted checking, or really we're paying out of this year's VBS. So we're paying out of this restricted fund because we're paying for VBS purposes, cash coming out, and we're going to put it on the CPH house account to pay off that balance. That's what I did wrong. So this is asset or liability for a check, and this is expense or liability. You wouldn't have a liability and liability. So if you move that to a liability, then you would just be doing an expense on that.
but that's what you're doing. So we're going to pay Concordia Publishing House $200 to clear our house account. If this was the credit card, we'd be paying the bank that owns the credit card. And we'll just say pay off account balance. Now you might say, well, why did we put under VBS rather than unrestricted? We could have done unrestricted, it worked in the same way, but that's not the purpose of unrestricted. So we'll go ahead and submit this. You'll notice that the credits and debits are down below. You don't have to look at them if you don't know what they are. And we'll hit save. So now we have a running balance. This is the transaction details where the first thing that we put on there was a payment for $200. Then we paid it off and now we're at $0. Now your assets will have gone down by those $200. It's just later than normal. If you had paid for the crafts out of your pocket or out of your checking account, well, then you would see that change happen with that transaction. But we didn't see that because we paid for the credit card. So this year's cash now has a line for payoff account balance going to CPH. Well, let's say that maybe when we did that initial transfer of cash, we did a thousand, maybe it was supposed to be 1200. You'll notice that here our bank accounts aren't matching, so we know it's wrong. How do you correct that? Well, it's pretty simple actually. You hit this line, you click this line by a thousand, and you say, actually it was supposed to be 1200. And so you put in the, whoops. Sorry, not there, right here. You put in the 1200 on both sides, it balances that, and then you just say wrong amount as the memo. And we'll hit save. Well, now the amount has changed and every good accountant in the room is getting very squirmy and feeling a little upset by that because you're not supposed to edit a transaction. Like that's the law, not really, but the, uh, the rule is that you leave transactions as they are. You create a journal entry to fix these things, but you track everything. Well, don't worry, we still do. If you click on this, it's just saying what the edit is. If you go and look in the general ledger report, which is up here under settings, sorry, that's not what I meant to do. Um, oops, let me backtrack a quick second. <laughs> here we go. So I edited that transaction. You'll notice that it is a $200 change and so it's not a new transaction. If I go under settings, sorry, reports, there's an event log right there. That event log will show you that I created a new transaction, a revision of an old transaction. So if I click on this, this transaction right here, I'm gonna show that $200 change as a completely different transaction. But this log tells me it's a revision of that transaction. That's what we're going for. All right, let me go back here a second. The other thing is, is that this was a check. Now up in my print queue, I have a check there. This will allow me to print off that check. So if I wanna print my checks directly from Ledger, I can do that. I go check, or check the box of the check, <laughs> no pun intended, and click print. This will show me what it looks like. This is the top part of the check that'll print on it. There's no number or anything because we're using pre-printed checks if we're printing out of it. And I'm sorry to say, you can't just print on paper and say, here's a check. That doesn't actually work. You have to have pre-printed official checks with your account number on it. But you can then have these details here. So we have another option for that. And um, that's where payments come in. We looked at payments a little while ago. It's the same kind of transaction path as a check, except checks allow you to print it out. Now we also have journal entries. Journal entries are essentially you just enter in the credits and debits, that's it. And so if you understand this chart and you wanna just use this chart, you can do journal entries all day long. You still have your memo and your date and your payee options. You know, all of that's there, you're just doing that. You put an account in, every time you click an account, it adds another row for you to put more in, and you do your debits and credits how you'd like. That is available, but I'm not gonna get into that, because again, I'm assuming you're not an accountant. 
All right, let's go back to my asset account real quick. I started going down this path and I needed to revert. So let's go to my checking account. I have a few different transactions here, including my edited transaction. And I get my month end bank statement. Well, this is where I go to hit reconcile. When I click reconcile, this puts the green on the screen, tells me I'm in a very different view. This reconcile view is meant to mirror what you do when you balance your checking account and your personal finances, or at least what you should do. You're looking at your bank account and you're getting a starting balance and an ending balance. And you're saying, all right, well, that the difference between those is what we received or sent out this month. And so the initial balance is zero because we started the accounts this time. And the ending balance is 28,270. So we have a statement difference of $20,270. Well, the reason that we do that is now we have several line items. We only have four line items on our account, on our bank statement. The first is the initial deposit, or if you're coming in from a, an existing bank account, you wouldn't have that, but you're gonna assume that this first one is there. And so that, because you're starting at zero this time, you're gonna click that. But then you've got your $3,000 deposit, your $175 transaction with CPH, a check for $200. That's what we paid to CPH um, to pay off our account. And then finally, we have this one orphan thing. Now, if you notice, these down here total the amount that's different. And in fact, if you hover over it, you can see what's different, the selected difference. Well, we've got off by of zero. And um, that means that we've covered everything. And actually this line here is just saying that there was a transfer involved, but it was the same bank account. So the bank didn't even know about it because we were transferring from unrestricted to restricted. So I'll just go ahead and select that to clear it out. Now it's possible that you're gonna have a lot more than five lines here. You might have 20 or 30 or 50. We've recently added a filter. So all you have to do is start typing. And if you're looking for that $25,000 one, you just start typing 25 and it'll filter down to that list. Or maybe you're looking for Concordia publishing house. You can do that as well. You could also look for, oops, let's say you know that was our starter kit. You go and look at the memo. So all of these different things will help you find exactly what you're going for. Now, once we reconcile, we'll hit save. It'll only save if the reconciled amount equals the difference between your beginning and ending balances. And so now we've reconciled those transactions and we get this little lock icon here saying it's been reconciled, which means we can no longer go and edit the transactions at all. You can click on it to view it, but it's locked down because we've said it matches what the bank has. All right. That is reconciliation. I'm just getting close to time. I've got about seven more minutes. I wanna remind you, if you have any questions during this webinar, go ahead and put them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them later on. But the next thing I wanna get into is budgeting. We've shown how you do your different transactions. All of this is great. But budgeting is one of those accountability aspects where you're looking ahead to next year and you're saying, what are we gonna spend on BBS? Well, let's go take a look. Budgeting's under settings. It's in the fisc or in the, the book settings. But when you budget, you're only budgeting income and expense. Now, at this point, we only have the VBS things in there. And I can only budget, I can budget for this year since it's presently happening, or next year if we were planning on it. Now I have a calendar fiscal year. I should go in and change it. Let's, I also have fiscal years here. I can always change it to be a July fiscal year if I wanted to. And what this will do, hang on just a second, Oops. is it should give me a shortened fiscal year. Well, it didn't, but I think that's because I, I didn't set it up right when I set up the account because I thought I'd set it up as a July fiscal year. So I'll have to look into that. But we're going to look at it just as a next fiscal year. If I go in here, what I can do is enter in the different budgets. 
but you'll see there's not there's a bunch of zeros right now there are some helpful things i get previous year's budget and previous year's actuals right here and so like here's may previous year offerings is 500 dollars. if i click on that 500 dollars, it'll say that's my amount for this year but i can also just go in and type in different amounts so let's say that's 500 and that's 200 100 however i want to do it you know the data that you get from previous year actuals is going to be your best data for budgeting but you have to have a year of actuals before you see that well maybe you don't want to go through month by month and say well we this past year we did that but i know we got two thousand dollars total i don't know exactly what the months are i don't want to look at all those details but i'm just going to type in two thousand dollars for offerings for vbs well as soon as i type it in there it overrides everything and splits it up by month and so now I have my 166.67, let's just say it was 2,400. I've got my $200 a month income. That's what I'm expecting to get in on, do on donations. And then I can say, well, I know under teaching materials, last year I spent $200 in May. I can pretty much assure, assume that I'm gonna spend that again. But then I'm also gonna buy some things in June for probably another 250. And you can add that in there and so you start to get your plan for next year now budgets are just a plan they're not a guarantee it's a, an art not a science but there's enough data to support it that can be a little bit more like a science than other things well once you put that all in there then you hit the save button which right now is hidden because i'm zoomed in so much but it's down the lower right hand corner in fact let's go back to 2020 And we'll show our VBS offerings. We'll say it's 2200, save it. And let's go to offerings here. I may not have enough lines to show anything. Yeah, I don't. Let's go ahead and do another quick deposit. Um, let's say that we've got some more, we'll put it under VBS cash. We got another $100 in offerings. We'll save that. There you go. So what you get when you have a budget is that you have your running balance, which is in the green, and you have your running budget, which is in the orange, and it says you're running, oh, sorry, I reversed this. Your running um, balance, oops, I don't have enough data on here. My running balance is 600, but at this point I was supposed to be higher than that, and so I'm under budget by 500. So if you look back at where I'm supposed to be under my budgets, it gives you the difference of that. I'm supposed to be at um, $183.34 times five, which is 900 or so. I think actually it would be by six based on where it's at. But either way, that's what's going on there. Normally you'd have more data and you would see the different lines, but I'm going after two straight lines, so that's not super helpful there. Should have known better. I should have put some transactions into start to show that, but that's all right. Well, if you're looking at a different time frame, like right now I'm at 2020, I have here a date selector with some pre-selected dates. So I can look at like quarter two and it'll filter all my transactions just by those that are in quarter two. Or I could look at just in May, and it'll show me only my May transactions, or I can do a custom one. Now from this area too, I can print or export to Excel, all those basic tools that you would expect. Well, let's take a look briefly at the types of reports that we have. If you go up here into reports, you'll have a general ledger report, which is every single transaction that you've had. Um, in fact, as you go through here, you'll see all of the things that we've done, there's the offerings, the cash deposit, all of that stuff is in good place. If we go to the entire year, you would filter it as well. So that date comes through all the way. All right, next, let's go to our income and expense. Now, just like budgets focuses on income and expense, you need to have a report that shows those actuals. So we've got this report that compares your 2020 budget with your 2020 actuals for whatever given time frame you select. Now this is for the entire year, so we're missing things that happen in the future, but it'll give you an idea. And then 
you can always collapse it and say, well, our income was this, our expenses were this, this is the difference. In a similar way, you have a balance sheet. I'm going to skip charter reports. I'll come back to balance sheet. Balance sheet says you've got your assets less, less liabilities. That's essentially what is truly true. You might have X amount in cash, but if you owe X amount in cash, your net is different. So you have assets less liabilities at the very bottom. And this will show you the changes over that period of time from January 1 all the way to the end of the year. And then finally, a similar view is your chart of accounts view, which is the same kind of columns, but it has assets and liabilities plus income and expense. This is a really good snapshot to say, where are you at today? So if you wanted to filter down to today's date, which is May 6th, which doesn't change anything because nothing's happened in the future yet, but you can do that and then your report is based on today's date. So those are the different reports you have. I, I'd also touch briefly on your event log. Let's, um, I'm over my presentation time, but get, let me show you users and roles because that's one last thing I want to highlight. If you look at roles, first off, roles are essentially what you have access to in the software. And so you might want to give access to people to do just a few things. So if I go and say, I want my VBS, oops, add a new one, VBS director, and this role applies to the church. I don't want them to manage the chart of accounts or do any of this other stuff. I just want them to see a few transactions and I don't want them to edit transactions. So I go ahead and it says, can view all accounts um, or can view, and that means certain ones. When I hit submit and then I click on there again, now I can see selected accounts. I can go through and just show the VBS accounts. Oops, we'll select all of those. I don't think there's a save button. My Zoom is really large here. All right, we'll go ahead and close that. So it can only view eight selected accounts. That means they can't do any of the transactions or anything else. They can just view their balances. So then I can go under users and say VBS director, or um, actually I need to add a new one right here. Now I can say VBS director at fake email address email address at .com, and then I select the VBS director role and if I hit submit then that VBS director will get an invite but when they log in they can't see everything just their accounts so it's an easy way to keep things secure all right I am over time we've got at least one person who's asked a question um, but before I get into the questions, I just want to remind you that you can start your free 37-day trial at 360ledger.com. You might say, why 300 or 37 days? Well, that's because it's basically a month and a week. That gives you time to do the reconciliation process and everything else. There's my contact information again. And so as I'm looking at the questions, I want to make sure you have a way to reach out to me or to our software consultants who can help you decide if Church 360 Ledger is a good fit for you. Their contact information is on the screen as well. All right, so Allison has the question, if you have a school, can you enter families and monthly tuition amounts? And can you sort and quickly see who is paid? Finally, can you print year-to-date totals if a family requests payment amounts for tax purposes? Well, Allison, I'm sorry to say that that is not in here. That is what would be called an account receivable tool. And with Church 360, we don't have accounts receivable in here because most churches don't need that. Now, you're talking about a school situation where you certainly do, um, but we know that many of the different schools are using a all-inclusive software that does not just the tuition tracking, but also the grades and everything else. In fact, that's what my school does. My church and school who uses Church 360 Ledger has a separate software that brings that in. And what we do is we track those transactions as bank transactions. You know, we get a deposit from that software and there's a separate bank account and then they will deposit it into our bank account. We track those transactions in here, but that software handles all of the billing. That way, or billing, not billing. 
that way it can um, manage you know the grades and everything else and say all right well you can't have your report card until your bill is paid that kind of thing that's what we find most schools do and so as we looked at building church 360 ledger we decided there just wasn't going to be enough people who could take advantage of that and we rather focus our development efforts elsewhere so that's why we don't have it if we get enough feedback we might be able to add it um, but we don't have that right now all right i should uh, I think my only other screen was uh, question and answers, but I'll put that up there. Um, Laura said, I'm the office administrator. Can I share the recording with the treasurer? Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to send you an email tomorrow morning with a link to the recording. Feel free to share it with whoever you want. And in fact, it'll be in our um, resource center, pardon me, and you'll have links to all of that. Now, while you say that, I should also point out, if you go to 360letter.com, pardon all my bookmarks there, in um, a little over a week, let me go down here to training, I'm going to be hosting a series of three webinars, I believe it is. Yeah, here we go, three webinars where I'm going to walk you through this process in greater detail, show you all the tools and everything. This was just an overview. But if you're interested in learning more in greater detail, come back on May 18th, 19th, and 20th, and we'll spend some time together really digging into that. And so if your treasurer is interested or if you're interested in learning more, sign up for these. These are free as well. Um, everything that we do afterwards is recorded and put in our resource center. And you can get to that at any of our websites, but if you're around 360ledger.com, Click on the Resource Center, and then when you get in there, you'll see Software. Go click on Church 360 Ledger, and there you go. And I have a number of other webinars there, and other people on our team have a lot of webinars too. But that's where you'll go. So that's where I'll be sending you tomorrow in the email. Since you signed up for the course, or if you are watching the recording, you already know that you got it. But since you signed up, you'll get that link. All right, I don't see any other questions, and I'm just about out of time. So unless something comes over in the next minute or so, I'm going to wrap up. Um, but again, thank you very much for being here today. I appreciate this. I hope this was helpful to you to at least get a, an understanding of what Church 360 Ledger does. My contact information is again on the screen. If you'd like more information, you'd like a personalized demo, contact our software consultants. You know, we have churches who will send a team of people to explore it um, you know, onto the phone call, not send them to our building, but they'll you know, put three or four people on to really evaluate the software, see if it's a good fit for them. Uh, our software consultants will be talking with you. You can verbalize on your questions, unlike today, and um, really get the answers that you need to decide if it's a good fit. So I hope this was helpful to you. If you have any follow-up questions, send me an email, and I'd be happy to get back to you then. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of the day.